hello. So my name is Julius Krobacek and I spent the last few years of my life working on the Babel routing protocol. And well, I've had some questions about it, so I guess I'm going to take some 40 minutes to tell you a few words about it. So first, the sales pitch. It's a loop avoiding distance vector protocol. I'm going to say what that means. It uses an algorithm that's known as distributed Bellman Ford, and its main claim to fame is that it has a strong invariant that guarantees loop freedom and guarantees good transient behavior. The other claim to fame is that it's a very simple protocol. You can understand it in two hours. You can implement it in two nights, if you're Marcus Stenberg. Normal human beings cannot implement it in two nights. So it has actually been re-implemented from scratch by Marcus Stenberg in two nights. Uh, and finally, we have found out, although this was not the original design criterion, is that it is very highly extensible. There have been uh, five extensions that have been defined over the years for various kinds of networks, and all of those extensions interoperate. You can have a Babel network using different variants, and all of that will work together. You might not get optimal behavior, but it's going to work. The gentleman over there is Dave Tatz, and he is my most challenging beta tester. <laughs> I don't know how he manages to build such heterogeneous and crazy networks. If you go to an official networking place, not here, if you go to a place where people have big routers that cost $20,000 and really nice cables and really nice links, they will tell you that is what a network looks like. So it has routers, I've marked them as circles, and it has links between the routers, and on links you have hosts that are attached. And each link has a prefix. And so, those networks are stable. Routers never crash. Well, they cost $20,000, so they better don't crash. And the links are transitive. If A and B and C are on the same link, if A can speak to B, then B and B can speak to C, then A can speak to C. And they put prefixes on the links, which allows a number of optimizations. That's called prefix-based routing. And on the other hand, if you come to Battle Mesh and speak with the people, they have a completely different vision of a network. A network is just a mess. You take a field, you put routers all over the place. There is no structure, no transitivity, no prefixes, and you expect, expect the routing protocol to take care of that. So the most challenging thing in those networks is that you have good links, so I've marked them with solid lines on the figure, and you have bad links. I've marked them with dashed lines. And if your routing protocol is stupid, it will prefer the bad links to the good links. And you absolutely must take it into account. So if you look at this figure, at the node that's at the bottom right, and the node that's at the extreme left, there is a single hop path between them. But this path is losing 97% of all packets. On the other hand, you have a three-hop path between them, and that route is losing no packets. And you want your routing protocol to be able to observe that and to choose the three-hop path. And I don't believe in mesh networks. So it's funny being at battle mesh and saying there, are no su there is no such thing as mesh networks. Mesh networks are useful in places where you cannot put wires. But there are always pieces of your network where you can put a wire. OK? I mean, it's, there's no point putting a wireless link if you control everything and can put a nice gigabit Ethernet that costs absolutely nothing. So what I believe uh, does exist are hybrid networks. Networks that have a bit that is wired and a bit that is meshy in the middle. And the meshy bit, and that's something that's very difficult to explain to traditional networking people, is used for transit. So here, in this figure, I have two classical wired networks at the two edges, and in the middle, there is some area that you cannot wire, 
and that's meshy. And communication between the two nice wired networks goes over the horrible mesh. And hybrid networks are what Babel was designed for. So the basic idea of Babel is let's do a routing protocol that makes absolutely no assumptions about what your network is like. It might be a classical wired network, it might be a meshy thing, or it might be one of those weird hybrid things with wires in some places, meshes in others, and you just want everything to work together. So there are no assumptions about topology. We don't optimize by assuming that topology is something. There are optimizations in Babel, but they are all optional. And at the same time, we don't assume that the network is stable. And here we do something that is very different from traditional routing protocols. Traditional routing protocols converge fast. What they do is that they assume that the network is stable, and then at some point, something breaks. And so, very quickly, they reconverge to a new topology. What Babel assumes is that the network is breaking and coming back all the time. I think of it as a cloth over the waves that are moving all the time. And what you want is to be reconverging all the time and have very strong guarantees about what happens when you haven't reconverged yet. So we have the luxury to reconverge slowly because we have nice properties before we've converged. The intuition behind Babel is that Babel does not try to always very quickly reconverge to a set of, of shortest paths. What it does is that it pushes packets roughly in the right direction. I've been lost recently here in Slovenia. The people are very friendly. You ask them, and they give you the rough direction of where you're going, and they tell you something in Slovenian, so you say, Hvala, and go in the rough direction that they indicated, and you end up at the Battle Mesh building. That is what Babel does. Oh, and it guarantees that you will never go twice through the same place, that the path that you follow is loop-free. Now, if you're going roughly in the right direction and according to loop-free path, there's really not much that can go badly wrong. The slogan is, whatever you do to it, Babel doesn't care. This animal here is called, in French, ratel. In English, it has many names, but one is the honey badger. And the honey badger likes, uh, the legend says honey. Actually, it li likes bee larva. And you know that bees sting. So in order to enter into a hive, you need to have a strategy. And the strategy of the rattle is to enter the hive and not care. <laughs> Okay, this is an example of what can happen in a classical routing protocol. Okay, this example is taken from OLSR, and I'd like to be very clear, I think that OLSR is a fine protocol. Okay, I'm giving an example of something that even OLSR doesn't avoid, while Babel does. So, here we have, on the first diagram up there, we have a very nice topology. We are trying to route packets towards S. A has a nice link towards S of metric one. B has a nice link towards A of metric one and a really bad link that goes directly to S. So A is sending packets to S and B is sending its packets through A. Okay, so the routing goes according to the solid lines there. And, that, and so, at some point, something happens. It starts raining. Someone goes through. Your neighbor turns off his microwave oven. And the link between A and S becomes very bad. It now has metric five. Horror. So A is close to S, is close to the link that just became bad, determines that the link is bad, and starts routing its packets through B, because now the best route is A, B, S. B, on the other hand, still hasn't noticed. A will flood the topology, but at a later point. It doesn't yet know that the AS link has become bad. And what happens? A is sending its packets to B. B is sending its packets to A. 
the packets are going ping pong. It doesn't last for very long. But that is an example of something that goes wrong transiently. As soon as the new topology is going to be flooded through the network, this problem disappears. So now that I've told you a little bit about what the goals of Babel are, I'm going to do two things. I'm first going to spend some time explaining how Babel works in pretty much in detail, quite technically. So if you're not into routing technicalities, and I am, I dream of routing. I spend most of my waking time thinking about routing. But if that's not your cup of tea, I suggest that you just doze off and think about something pleasant. And later, I will have a second part in which I will tell you what we've managed to do with this kind of technology, and I'll wake you up. So the basic algorithm behind Babel is called distributed Bellman Ford, sometimes known as the distance vector protocol. So that's something that is very simple, very pleasant, and very easy to explain. And most of you already know it, but I like it so much that I'm going to explain it again. So please bear with me. So in distributed Bellman Ford, the algorithm is run for every destination. And traditionally, the destination is known as the source. So that's why I write S. And every node maintains two variables. One is the distance to the source, and one is the next hop to the source. So initially, that's my first column on the left, S knows how to go to S and says, hey, I'm at distance zero to S. While A, B, and C have no idea how to go to S, so they say, I'm at infinite distance. And whenever it wants to, S broadcasts to all of its neighbors the information, hey, I'm at distance zero of S. At one point, A will receive the information. And it will think, hmm, my neighbor S is telling me that it's at distance zero of S. If I go through S, I will be at distance one. And so, that's my second column. A has set itself at distance one to S and says, in order to route towards S, I send my packets to S. That's what the next hop variable says. And A broadcasts it to all of its neighbors. It broadcasts it to S, but S doesn't care, because it already has a better route. While B and C say, hey, cool. If A is at distance one, then we are at distance two. And they set their distance to two, and their net next hops to A. Look, in just two steps of the algorithm, we've converged to the tree of shortest path. You cannot do faster than that. You cannot converge faster than going once through the network. This is the full algorithm. Don't read it. Just look at it. It can be written in one slide. There is a lot of optimizations you can do to that, but that's the only routing algorithm that I know that you can write in one slide. It's absolutely beautiful. I've just explained it to you in five minutes. There is, it is just so right. It is so elegant and so simple. And it only has one flaw, which is that it doesn't work. The problem is, that sometimes links break. So suppose that the link between S and A breaks. There are many reasons. Either S crashed, or SA is a radio link that is no longer functional, or somebody simply unplugged an Ethernet cable. At this point, A realizes, at some point, A realizes that it can no longer use its best route towards S. So it thinks, let me see. Who among my neighbors has a route to S? But B and C still haven't noticed that the route to S has broken. They have no way of saying. So they are still announcing a metric of two. So he says, hey, cool. I can go through B. That's what happens next. B is announcing a metric of two, so I will announce a metric of three. So you see what happens in my second column? A is sending its packets to B. B is sending them to A. There's a routing loop. 
At some point, B hears that A is no longer a distance one, it's now a distance three. So it says, hey, that's not the best route any longer. I'll switch to C. And that's what happens in my third column there. So A is sending its packets to B, B is sending its packets to C, C is sending its packets to A. At some point, C will notice, so it will switch to a metric of four. Some other node will switch to a metric of five, six, seven, and the loop only disappears when we reach infinity. That's known as counting to infinity. And there's only one elegant solution to that, which is to fix a small value for infinity. So most distance vector routing protocols use the value of 16 for infinity, so that this process ends after 16 hops. So the slogan of traditional distance vector is good news travel fast, but bad news travel very, very slowly. When a link is created, we can learn about the new link in time proportional to the diameter of the network. But when a link is broken, what happens is that we need to count up to infinity. Who was the first person who did something stupid in this example? What is the original sin here? Okay. So who says it's A? Who says it's B? Okay, why B? Uh -huh. But A did something wrong. A created the routing loop. So I would tend to agree with the notion that it's A because the, root was, the, loop was, the first loop was created by A. And that once A created this loop, all things went really wrong. So that would be my analysis. I would agree with the A, yeah? yeah Perhaps in the back. Absolutely. I'm going to come back to the solution now. Okay. So what's happened here is that A broke an invariant that you would in intuitively expect. If I'm sending my packets to you, then you have a lower metric than I do. And here what happens is that A has a metric. Um, when A switched routes, B is sending its packets to A, but it hasn't noticed yet that A has a higher metric. Okay, so a old idea is that in Bellman Ford, we can ignore some updates. So what we are going to do is that we're going to do Bellman Ford. This is just Bellman Ford. In comparison with the previous slide, I've just changed the bits in blue. And what we're going to do is that we are only going to accept really trustworthy updates only when we are sure they don't create a routing loop. And we are, if we are not sure, we go, la, 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 I haven't heard you. Okay, and that's formalized as a feasibility condition. So the feasibility condition is a function of the node, the distance, and some other data f. And if feasible is true, then we have a guarantee that there is no loop. Okay, and we do exactly the same thing we did before except that now we are very carefully only accepting feasible routes. Of course, the trick is finding the right feasibility condition that will give you enough routes while simultaneously avoiding all loops. And there have been three historically. One is the one that both gentlemen here were thinking about, which is the BGP feasibility condition. So, BGP feasibility means I accept to every announcement we attach the whole path and I only accept a route if I'm not on it. So you're giving me a route and you're telling me, look, those are the hops and I check if I'm among the hops and if I am, I say I'm not interested in this route, it's a routing loop. 
If so that works really well. It has one major flaw, is that updates become very big, become very large, because you have the whole root. In BGP, there are other mechanisms to deal with that, like a reliable transport and stuff, but we would, don't want to be doing that in a mesh network. The other feasibility condition is the DSDV feasibility, which is based on the observation that the only way to create a loop is to increase your metric. So if you look here, when A made its mistake, it increased its metric from one to three. And DSDV feasibility says, I accept roots if they don't increase my metric. And what Babel uses is dual feasibility. So dual feasibility is based on the notion that whenever I send an update to my neighbors, I remember the value. And I remember the smallest value of all the updates that I've ever sent. And I accept a root only if it has a better metric than the smallest value I've ever sent. The intuition is perfectly clear. Suppose you send me a metric. You send me a root with a given metric. If it is better than everything that I've ever sent, it cannot possibly go through me. And that's the basic idea. So now you're really annoyed. You consider me as a charlatan, and you say, this cannot possibly work. You cannot always get better metrics. In real life, it doesn't work like that. Ah, sorry. So here's a quick example of feasibility. The same example as before. A has metric one, B has metric two, C has metric two, and the feasibility distances are one, two, two. The link to S breaks. A loses its root. Its feasibility distance is one. The two available roots have metric two. They are not feasible. They are ignored. There are no roots. Finished. We've gotten rid. We never created a rooting loop. It worked beautifully. Uh -huh. No? If A crashes but comes up again immediately, then it has no memory anymore. Yeah. It doesn't know that there was a it has an infinity and receives an update from B. Yes. It will accept it? Yes. It will configure all to B? Yes. If you lose your feasibility state, absolutely. The feasibility distance is hard state. And that is the flaw of the al algorithm. If a node crashes, it might create a transient routing loop. So it will last very shortly, but there is a possibility when state is lost to create one. Hmm? It's, not it's not an ever for other reasons, which are more severe than this one. OK, this one, is, your case is extremely unlikely. And what Babel does is that it stores its state in persistent storage. Of course, not on OpenWRT. OK, but yes, if you lose your state, you, may, you might be temporarily in trouble. Are you? No, you won't. You won't because you've also lost the route to S. No, yes, you are right. There will be a temporary. Hmm? A, the A crash starts again and receives from B and so, Of course, if B is still sending stuff to A and A re crashed and rebooted so fast that B didn't detect that it was crashed, then it might happen. This won't happen in practice. Until we have OpenWRT routers that boot in less than 10 seconds, that won't happen. But yes, it is a theoretical possibility. It doesn't crash. Hold on. Once again. Yes. As soon as there is communication, as soon. So in all cases in Babel, as soon as a packet goes once round the loop, the loop is resolved. 
So the aim is to have, so we are assuming here that, um, that uh, the network is very unreliable. So we would, like, we would really like to avoid the loops uh, in all cases. Okay, so that is really something I would like. In all cases, what I promise is that all in all cases, once an update goes around the loop, it gets discarded, as you say. May I also ask a question? Uh, in the first place, you told us that this, uh, we have a hybrid network, right? What if we, we have uh, a double link between S and B, for example, one that is uh, a cable link or a fiber link, and the other one is a wireless link? Yes? How the protocol behaves in such Very well. I Very mean, well. I, I mean, it, it chooses the fiber until there's a problem, so then it switches to the wireless. I'll, I'll come to that ah. in a second. OK, so the main problem with this kind of thing is what happens when you have no longer any feasible routes. So here's an example, very simple topology. Distance A and B are both taking the direct route to S. The feasibility distances are one, the distances are one, and then the direct link between A and S breaks. You would like S, A, sorry, to take the route through B, which has metric two. But this route is not feasible because two is larger than one. And here, node A is starving. So imagine the tragic vision of node A starving in front of a table laden with food just because it cannot prove that the food is loop-free. This has to be solved somehow. OK, so first, let's make a thought experiment, which is, can this be solved? The answer is yes. Reboot the whole network when that happens. OK, good, it can be done. So now let's try to find a practical solution. So what happens in the best known protocol, loop avoiding protocol, which is called EIGRP, is that in that case, we make a global synchronization, complicated algorithm that makes a global synchronization of, of all nodes and say, let's forget about our feasibility distances. Let's start anew. Okay. So that works very well in wired networks. But a global synchronization in a mesh network with massive packet loss, that's not going to work. So the idea that was originally, that is used by Babel, was originally introduced in DSDV, and it is called sequenced routes. So sequenced routes are just like normal routes, but instead of carrying just a metric, just a D, they carry a pair of an S and a D. So S is known as the sequence number, and you might want to think of, of it as a clock. A higher S means a more recent root. So the S is an arbitrary value, and the only person who is allowed to increment it is the source, the originator of the routing information. And everyone else just propagates the S unchanged. And instead of using for feasibility the ordering on metrics, what we use is this ordering, which I write better. So what this formula here says is that a root carrying SM is better than a root carrying S prime M prime when either it is more recent, S is larger than S prime, or it is equally recent and the metric is better. And now we do exactly the same feasibility dance, but instead of working with the ordering on metrics, we work on the ordering on SM pairs. Quick example, the same as above. A has sequence, the sequence number is one. A has lost its root. The feasibility distance is one, one. So the root through B is not feasible. At some point, S increases its feasibility distance, uh, increases, sorry, its sequence number, and bang, the root becomes feasible again because two is more recent than one. We've solved starvation. So the problem that remains is how do we solve temporary starvation in cases where the sequence number 
doesn't arrive fast enough. So DSDV used periodic increases, and that doesn't work very well. What Babel does is that it is the starving guy who calls around and says, hey, I'm starving, please send me a new sequence number. So this guy does have some roots. They are just not guaranteed to be loop-free. So following those non-necessarily loop-free roots, it sends a cry for help. Everyone else notices the cry of help. If it goes a loop, other people throw it out. I won't get into the details. And, and it gets a new se sequence number in a timely manner. I'm running a little bit short of time, but there are a few other problems to solve. One is the problem of multiple gateways, because you don't want to be synchronizing sequence numbers. So that is a problem that Babel solves, but in a case, uh, in a way that is not guaranteed to be loop-free. So as you were saying earlier, there is another case here. If two gateways crash at exactly the same time, you might have a short-lived loop. But once again, once an update goes round the loop, the feasibility mechanism will break the loop. So this is the claim that I'm making. This algorithm is loop-free in the absence of crashes and in the absence of multiple gateways. If there are multiple gateways, if two gateways crash at the same time, a loop may appear, but it will disappear as soon as we've gone run once round the loop, and that is a theorem. A theorem means that I have spent two weeks of my life writing down the details, and somebody looked at the, theory, at the proof and says, yeah, it looks like that should work. Okay, so that's really cool. Cool technology, simple, can be explained in half an hour, a little bit more. But what can you do with that? Well, we can use that over all kinds of networks. In everything I've told you, I've made absolutely no assumptions about the topology, about how the network behaves, about stability. So originally, Babel was using just two kinds of routing. It was using the classical ETX stuff over wireless links and the classic two out of three stuff, just checking if you can get a hello across over wired links. And over the years, we found that the mechanisms that I've just described are so general that there is plenty of cool stuff you can do with that. So I've told you about metrics. I've manipulated metrics and you've accepted them. Just to remind you what a metric is, the metric is what you are trying to minimize. You know when you press on your GPS and you choose the shorter, the cheapest, or whatever? That's the metric. And I would like you to notice that I've actually found a screenshot of a GPS that uses the word metric. And one of the claims to fame of Babel is that it is going to work with all sorts of different metrics. So one of the coolest metrics that Babel uses is a metric that avoids radio interference. So you have wireless routers, A, B, C, that are using the same radio frequency. You are going to lose some throughput due to interference between the two. So there are many solutions. You could put some cables. Hey, this protocol can do hybrid networks. Let's avoid interference by putting cables. But in some situations, you cannot do that. You can put a Carusa somewhere. I'm sure Babel would work great over a Carusa. However, that might not be possible in some cases. But Wi-Fi chips cost absolutely nothing. So let's build a router with five different radio frequencies. But now you need to have a protocol that is able to detect the frequencies and choose the route with least interference. And that's very difficult. So here's a very simple example. I have three routers, A, B, and C. B and C are nice routers with two radios, say a 2.4 gigahertz and a 5 gigahertz radio. And A is a cheap router that only has one uh, radio at 2.4. We all know that 2.4 is better than 5. And so the ETX has detected 
that the link between B and C at 2.4 has a metric of 1, but the link at 5 gigahertz has a metric of 1.2. So the best route for B to go to C is the route that goes through the 2.4 link. But if A takes the same route, you have A, B, C, it is better for A to use the route that goes through. It would be better for A if B used the route that goes through the 5 gigahertz link. Okay, that's somewhat counterintuitive. And what this example says is that liberal economics doesn't work. That the egoistic choice of your neighbor is not necessarily the best choice for you. Okay? And so such a metric is known as a non-isotonic or non-distributive metric in the literature. And as far as I know, BGP and Babel are the only routing protocols being deployed right now that can deal with non-isotonicity. One day, somebody called me in France and said, look, uh, I am the boss of a small company and we are using Babel. And I said, cool, what do you do? Well, that's complicated. Can I invite you for lunch? He paid for lunch. So full disclaimer, he did pay for lunch, but he never gave me any money. Um, and we sat in a nice restaurant in the fifth arrondissement, and he told me, look, what we are doing are overlay networks. We have distributed data centers in different countries, and the problem is that the IPv6 routing is not stable enough. So you, we are putting a bunch of tunnels between our data centers and using Babel to route over them. And that works really well when it works. So for example, he said, we have this topology up there. We have a data center in Lille in northern France, one in Paris, one in Marseille, and one in Tokyo. And that works really well. Babel chooses the route from Lille to Marseille. And now the link between Lille and Marseille goes down. From the point of view of Babel, the route through Paris and the route through Tokyo have the same quality. They both have zero packet loss. And we don't like our French traffic going through Tokyo. And I said, well, just, you know, just tweak the metric. You have a configuration file. He said, no, I don't think you understand. I am not going to tell you how many routers we have, because that's a commercial secret, but we are not going to tweak every single one of those. So a student of mine, Baptiste Jonglaise, and I sat for a long time and decided to use the round trip time as a metric. Now, everyone knows in the routing community that using round trip time is not possible, because it creates instabilities. When you use round trip time, it's like on the highway, you know, you have two highways, and so everyone takes the better highway, and the traffic stops. So then the radio announces that you should be taking the other highway, and so everyone shifts to the other one, and so on, and so on. So the link gets congested, the RTT increases, you switch to the other route. So you will get oscillations. So here, technically, this is called a negative feedback loop. But you know what? Babel doesn't care. You can have root oscillations. Babel is still pushing packets in the right direction, except that some packets will go on the left, some on the right. We've actually tweaked the protocol in such a way that the frequency of the oscillations is on the order of one minute. So it works pretty well, even in the congested case. And in the uncongested case, we have no oscillations. And the reason we do that is that we have flexible route selection. If you use OLSR, for example, you need to take the shortest metric route. Otherwise, the algorithm collapses. In Babel, we just need, we can pick any route as long as it's feasible. In particular, you can take a route that doesn't have the shortest metric. And so what we do is that we pick the route with the longest metric that has been around for a while. I don't have time to go through the detail, but this is the description of the algorithm. The intuition behind the hysteresis algorithm is that if you have a really good route that has been good for a while, 
then you can trust it. But if you have a really good root that has only just appeared, it can be a transient blip, it can be a drive-by night root. So you don't take it, you wait for a while, but only if you have other roots. If all you have is a recent root, you still take it. And the last, ex uh, the last extension we did, so there are circles in this figure, and that's the second time I'm using a Mac to give a talk with this figure, and both times the Mac failed to render the routers in this figure. So, source-specific routing is a small extension to the routing paradigm, which has absolutely huge consequences. And Mathieu Boutier, who is the gentleman in the blue t-shirt sitting in the middle of the room, is going to give a talk tomorrow to speak about source-specific routing. I'm extremely excited about source-specific routing, and I'm extremely annoyed that it's Mathieu and not myself giving the talk tomorrow. So, source-specific routing, but it's only fair because he has done most of the work. So, the idea of source, the main application of source-specific routing is the case where you have your nice home network or mesh network or whatever, and you're connecting it to two ISPs. Typically, doing that requires either accepting that sometimes all your routes will break because you switch gateways, or else using some techniques such as encapsulation, tunneling, with all the problems that they cause. Source-specific routing solves the same problem, but in a very clean and very elegant manner. And, well, Mathieu will tell you some more stuff about it, but I'd just like to mention to finish that source our work on source-specific routing was motivated by people from the ITF HomeNet working group, and I will give a flash talk at some point to tell you a few words about HomeNet. It's robust, it's flexible, it works reasonably well on wired networks, perhaps not as well as dedicated carrier protocols if you have 10,000 routers on a single link. If you have such huge, huge networks, you might want to be using OSPF or ISIS, but it works reasonably well on wired networks. It works reasonably well on wireless networks. It hasn't been as finely tuned as some of the dedicated mesh routing protocols, but its performance is pretty honorable. And it's a, because it's such a simple protocol, it's a great framework for experimenting with new ideas about routing. We've done source-specific routing. Mathieu has done source-specific routing. We've done radio interference routing. We've done delay-based routing. And we've written down everything. Everything we know about Babel, you can find written down in publicly available repositories. Thank you very much for your attention. Chwala za pozornost. Hmm? Oh, sorry. RTT needs round trip time and it's delay of a link, sorry. There was one question before, it was from him, uh, how Babel decides what, uh, what has to choose if you have a, a perfect wireless link and a perfect wireless link. Okay, so the default metric used by Babel with no configuration is to detect automatically if a link is wired or wireless, use a metric of 64 or infinity without link quality on the wired link, and use a metric of 256 times ETX over the wireless link. Okay, I didn't understand your question, I'm sorry. Um, if, now that breaks, for example, if you put a wireless radio behind a switch. Okay. So it does its best. In cases where it doesn't do the right thing, you can configure things manually. So for example, the base metric, the thing that gets multiplied by ETX, is something you can tweak. You can do arbitrary filtering. You can dispatch on many. You have a fairly powerful configuration language that allows you to do all sorts of metric tweaking. Yes, yes. It will be given to the organizers and they will put it online. We usually attach that to the agenda. So everyone who's giving a talk please attach your PDF to the wiki page of the agenda or put the link into the agenda and then this is taken care of. I'm curious about the size of the networks that you uh, run a lot of tests with. 
So the network we are running our tests on is, Mathieu will know better than me, 10 routers. Okay, the largest network for which I had actual results was 1,500 routers and Babel collapsed really badly with 1,500 routers, which has been fixed since then. Okay, and I'm not allowed to tell you what was the application and I'm not allowed to tell you which, what is the company, which is so extremely annoying, <laughs> but I'm sorry. And was that network across uh, heterogeneous uh, No, that was a pure mesh network. So just to finish, the bad case is where you have a lot of neighbors. Okay, so heterogeneous is actually easier than pure mesh. Pure mesh is the bad case. It is the really bad case. Does it work only for Linux? Or especially the cross layer thing? Does it work for other operating systems? So uh, ba we keep Babel in order to keep ourselves honest. So we run Linux, but we want to remain honest. So uh, we keep, we try to the best of our means to keep the BSD port current. It does work on a Mac. <laughs> That's the BSD port. Now there are some features missing. On a, um, on a BSD box, you won't get automatic frequency dependent routing. You need to configure this interface is on channel seven. And if you get it wrong, you will get suboptimal routing, and source-specific routing doesn't work on BSD. Okay. Interesting project, if you're interested. <laughs> Why is it called Babel? Because I wanted a name that can be pronounced in many languages. <laughs> the original name was Ariane, which I think was a better name than Babel. Ariane is Ariadne, the woman who held the string for Theseus in mytholo mythology, so he would find the way in the labyrinth. She's, about, she's the goddess of rooting, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps. In the We need to write a version of Babel that works in the NS3 simulator to do that, because we're not going to get hundreds of thousands of nodes. So Nexedia are running, Nexedia, the company who, for whom we did the RTT dependent stuff, is running on a large network, but they don't want to tell me how large they consider it as a secret, as a commercial secret. So we need to build our own, and the only way to build our own is simulation. I don't trust simulation because there is a lot of protocols that work beautifully well in simulation but don't work in the real world. But now we've reached the point where we do need to have a simulation. Yeah? What is the status of the embedded version of Babel? Can you tell something about that? Embedded? Yeah, the embedded version of Babel. The stripped down one. Oh, um, uh, so it is very much, so it's, I think it's product of production quality. It doesn't do, um, it only does stub routing. So that means that it learns routes, it will send packets in the optimal direction, but on the other hand, it doesn't re-announce routes. So it, will only, it is only useful for a host that wants to participate in Babel, not for somebody who routes other people's packets. Okay. And it is, and the reason for that is that I like keeping it at 700 lines of code, because having a routing daemon in 700 roots, uh, lines of code is a pretty good bragging argument. It's still too big for IOT. For? It compiles down to about 12K. Yeah. And most IOT devices have a total of 64K, which includes the operating system. Yeah. I look forward to the assembly language for OK. Are you are you're volunteering, right? <laughs> or did I misread you? <laughs> I think we are running out of time, so yes? You gave some numbers for how much nodes it scales and indicated the problem with many links. Do you have an idea of how much links? Or when did it start to become problematic? 
No. So the And what what version was that? And what? Yeah. Do you remember the version, or at least the date, or the year, when you saw those products? Uh, but was it like uh, last week or uh, three years ago? No, something in between. But not <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> Axel, Axel, would you, would it be, would it be rude to say that this is not the most useful bug report I have ever received? <laughs> Okay. Okay, we made quite a lot of improvements, so that would be some six months after Catalonia on the request mechanism. So that might be what you have been seeing. That was the year after Catalonia. Yeah, that, that, should have been yes, there was such an issue a few years ago with dense networks. Yeah, so that would coincide. So it was less than two years from now? Yeah. Okay, perhaps we can discuss it offline. Well, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>